Welcome to the Prodigal and the Priest podcast, a podcast about faith, sports, and two friends from different cultures. Here are your hosts, Joey Scansella and Father Paul Bechter. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, whenever you're listening to us, welcome. What's up, Father Paul? Not much, man. How you doing? Doing all right, doing all right. Today for us is a Thursday afternoon, which is kind of the beginning-ish of our weekend time. You know, we work on the weekend, and at least for me, I work on the weekend. I don't know about you. You're off on Fridays, right? Yeah. And okay, then that's I what do you're going a lot for. of the streaming on Saturday and diff- other days. Yeah, no, so. we are shifting yeah. into kind of weekend mode. Yeah. So yeah. I always like this one because we record this for people to be able to listen to it on Friday. This is our question show. So Prodigal and the Priest and me. I don't know why we don't just stick with Prodigal and Priest question show. Dude, Prodigal and the Priest and me is way catchier. Is it? It is, though. Let's take a poll. Call in. Do we have a number they can call in? We're not live. We're not live, but we should do a live. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> we should do a live show sometime. That would be awesome. Hour. That would be fun. That would be good. But anyway, we got some fun questions today. You ready? I am ready. Let's do this. All right. First one comes in from Brian. Father Paul, your full beard has been on point. On fleek. I'm going to ignore that. Do you mind sharing the significance of your beard? Cassock on the weekends, special things you do during the consecration, in parentheses, maybe hand and finger placement mm-hmm. that you bring to your celebration here at St. Anne's. Thanks, guys. So All the special things. Talks about beard, cassock. Also, for our listeners who are St. Anne parishioners, if you go back and look at carnival photos from how many years ago was it five years ago six years ago 2013 carnival 2013 carnival try to find 2013 carnival photos and you can see father paul before he grew the beard that year of pastoral year where we say you look you look a lot like spock i do it's terrifying um there's a picture of me out there from when i was a seminary and even before that 2011 summer of 2011 and I'm at my summer assignment in France, in this mm. parish in Brittany, um, a place in France. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, and weird. Called Keep Rond. And anyway, I didn't have a, a beard, and I got put in their local newspaper uh, together with the priests there. Yeah. And I look super like Spock, like 100% like young Spock. Look it up. Look it up, everybody. 2013. So... Anyway, any significance about your beard, cassock? I know we touched on the cassock a little bit when Greg yeah. was here, but he gave a maybe, good answer. Maybe while you um, personally decide to mm-hmm. wear one, and then also Brian's asking about placement and certain things during, um, um, like certain things you concentrate on during the mass: hands, finger placements, different things like that. Yeah, sure. Okay. Well, the beard is just because I like it. That's basically it. I mean, I also get to read Psalms like the oil flowing down Aaron's beard and stuff mm-hmm. like that and be like, yeah. all right, priesthood, there it is. So you think you'll ever go no beard? Man, I don't know. Like, <laughs> if, That's your drop. Yeah, that's my drop. Um, yeah, I, I, I really don't see myself going no beard. Okay. But I never saw myself growing it quite this long either. So there you it's go. It's kind of just a... Uh, Taking it moment by moment. Yeah. I think Augustine has this whole treatise, St. Augustine, mm. on like why beards are awesome. Like a church father says this. I believe it. Um, I mean, it's the in thing right now. Let's also face that. Okay. It is the in thing. No, it is. It I, definitely is. As much as you don't like to be doing the in thing or follow <laughs> the in trends. I want to be before or after. Right. It's the in thing. It is the in thing. I have a. I don't want to digress too much, but I have a little story. Go for about it. the beard. Um, when I was a seminarian and I got to serve for the Holy Father, and uh, we asked. So my beard wasn't anything near this long. It was just kind of close cropped, but it was still a beard. Yeah, very, uh, like a half inch, well trimmed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It looked neat, um, respectable. 
all the things. And we asked the the MCs, like the guys who were in charge of the servers at the practice, like, what is the, is there a policy on beards? Like, it's been a Roman custom for a long time to be clean shaven. That's right. kind of a thing uh, throughout more recent church history and more recent, like 300 years or something. But, um, and so we just asked them on that and they were like, well, it's a Roman custom to be clean shaven, but they didn't say don't do it. And then, um, there were some other guys with beards in the group and, uh, the morning of the mass, I was in our chapel praying and I was ready to leave right after that. And turns out they got in kind of cold feet and they were like, all right, we're all going to shave our beards. And so I was the only one bearded nice out of like 15 guys who were serving this mass and i happened to be a middle height for all of the servers and the way they chose who did the incense and who held the book and who held the cross was based on height they lined us all up all like 15 of us by height and we had some giants who were there like six foot seven and six foot eight seminarians so they were holding the cross the shortest guy was holding the book so he didn't block the holy father and I was exactly in the middle. So I got to do incense. So not only am I the only guy with a beard, and I'm feeling kind of awkward, but it's too late to go back on it. Yeah. Um, feeling kind of hung out to dry by the others. Anyway, um, I'm also like front and center, very public. And one one of my family members like saw me on TV uh, holding up the thurible, the thing you put incense in. Mm. Um so that the Holy Father could put the incense in and like screenshotted it and it just went around the family and all this stuff. <laughs> um, yeah. Was so, this, it's, so that's a beard story. There's not really a moral to it. It's just this a was Francis? Story. Or, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I asked that because we'll be, there's another question here mm. after this. So we need to get to the last part here. Though. Oh, yeah, Cassick yeah. Cassick, and sorry. And uh, Brian actually has a question. So. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. Not just talk about beards yeah. randomly. Yeah. Um, so that's the beard as I like it. The cassock is similar, but with a little bit more meaning to it. Um, I've always liked having the opportunity to wear it when I could. And uh, liked the fact that it was part of part of how a priest dressed. Um, that it's a historical mode of dress, but it's still allowed and even normative to some point uh, in the way the documents are today. So I always kind of liked it. It's I, I get that it's not part of our our sort of normal priestly culture in Dallas to wear cassock, but right. I think it's a good sign value for people. Like mm -hmm. it was pretty awkward when I first started wearing it because people look at you weird. They look at you weird anyway when you're wearing a, a priestly collar, right? But they really look at you weird with this. Like I've been in Walmart wearing a priest collar before, and had people like tap me on the back. And say, excuse me, sir, where can I find this? Because, you know, you're just wearing all black. And they think that you work there. More uniformed, yeah. Yeah. You, so it looks a little bit more normal. This looks super weird. And I think that's why people don't like to like to wear it. Why it's kind of a rare thing. Yeah. Um, but Probably what a lot of religious orders mm -hmm. and um, experience in their habits. <laughs> right, exactly. And so this is, this is like my diocesan habit. And uh, for me, anyway, I'm at a point where... Like having somebody look at me strangely uh, does not make me feel awkward anymore, but makes me think this is a chance to evangelize. Um, and I think it's totally worth it. Yeah. Also, it's kind of fun to wear. Yeah. There you go. Uh, and then S significance of the strings on the back. The string. Okay. So the one I'm wearing doesn't actually have strings. Oh, I thought this, I, yesterday. You yeah. I was wearing a different one. Oh, look at Multiple. that. Multiple. I don't wear the same cassock every day. Well, I'm sure somebody's going to write in and say, how often do you have to wash them? And then knowing also <laughs> clericalism, they'll be like, can we hand wash the clothes for you and all of that? <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. The strings on the back uh, are on the one that's a little bit dressier. Uh, but Greg had a good point talking about the cassock as like a work um, garment and the one that I'm wearing right now is very lightweight it's kind of a summertime one and it really does have that feel of like putting on my work habit it's okay if it gets dirty because it's not like dress wear formal wear mm. um, the strings give it a bit dressier feel but they're really there just to keep like the cloth belt up where it should be there you go so cool. and then stuff during the mass uh, it's kind of a vague question but it's also like I have gotten to the point where I guess I've been a priest for long enough 
where um, I say mass pretty much exactly the same way uh, every time, even down to small gestures. And that really helps me pray. And so I'll always do certain things like right before the moment of consecration, I'll wipe my fingers on the corporal. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's like... Both to get my fingers clean if for some reason there's like some fluff on it. I've already washed them, mm-hmm. right, at the lavabo during the offertory. But you wipe it off, and it's it's more than anything else a reminder to me of what I'm about to do. <laughs> like I'm about to act in persona Christi, saying this is my body, this is my blood, right. and confect the body and blood of Christ in the Eucharist. And so like all those little things um, that I do and – that I try and do consistently every time, even even the way I move a little bit. It's I try not to be stilted about it, but I try not to like sidestep or move too casually. Right. Um, it's all there to remind me and hopefully everybody else that this isn't a normal thing. Um, that there's this is the greatest um, gift that we have and the supernatural act of making uh, the sacrifice of Christ on the cross and his death and resurrection, the mysteries um, which save us, yeah. making them present again. And there's um, something to be said, uh, both of us being sports fans, not about mm, superstition, but about routine. Yeah. No, a very batter much. gets in, you know, the batter's box and does a certain thing with his batting gloves and mo- feels most comfortable in that moment yeah. to perform the sports duty he's about to do. And so, yeah, no, there's definitely that that sort of consistency value. Yeah. Um, Cool. Because if you're doing it, sorry, no, go for it. If you're doing everything the same time, the same way all the time, you don't have to think about it anymore. And you can think about the things that are most important. Exactly. Um, Which side note, little asterisk, probably good for Brian to know and our listeners to know within the Roman Missal, there are instructions of what you should be doing as well, yeah. like bow here. Right. Correct. I mean, yeah. I and just don't know if people pretty, know that. No, they're, yeah. So it's not a free for all. Uh, the instructions are called the rubrics, um, but the rubrics aren't aren't terribly prescriptive. There is something like historically that was more. I guess historically they were more restrictive to emphasize that sort of like, um, I guess, uniformity yeah, um, more. And they're not as restrictive anymore. So you see, like, it's, it's not to say, like, you know, variation isn't, isn't permitted. Um, like, you know, if another priest doesn't carry his hands and move himself in exactly the same way as I do, they're like, they're doing it wrong. Right. That's not, not exactly the case. But, um, yeah, so, so there are... Like it does say to bow slightly when you're saying the words of consecration. Right. Um, and a lot of people wouldn't know that. That's a great example. Awesome. All right, next one. We got two kind of, uh, I don't know, a little bit heavier ones. So uh, one is on <laughs> pretty much the question just comes in anonymously. It said, what did the Pope really mean when he just uh, spoke recently in his... Uh, interview and for those who are unsure of what this listener is asking essentially what has come out on a lot of catholic news and around the internet social media and all that is big headlines that says like pope endorses encourages um same-sex unions you know um all of that so i want to pause there before we actually go a little bit deeper into it and just say first off you need to do your homework and research even if it is a good catholic resource you need to be able to really dive into it and say okay what did we what did he really mean here what did he really Mm -hmm. say and not just go off the first headline you see always good advice always good advice um i highly recommend one from father augustino who's a cfr he speaks on speaks on the Steubenville circuit and he just had a good response because he actually translated it and watched the original recording in Spanish, which was done of this interview. 
And he said, there is a little bit of the language that can get lost between the translation that we heard of, oh, the Pope's okay with um, same-sex unions, homosexual unions, and that what Father Augustino was saying is, really he's saying that a homosexual civil convenience in the sense that anybody is a child of God and it has the right to certain kind of standards of life and living and insurance and different things like that, and that even if we disagree that this is not a marriage because he says that can't change. That was revealed by God, man mm-hmm. and woman and all that. That um, as man and woman and and uh, created by God, we have certain rights. And so I just toss all that out for initial impressions, thoughts, all of that. Um, yeah. Yeah. All right. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Here we go. So first of all, my my disclaimer is that I haven't followed this story closely at all. Um, and that's not me trying to dodge the question. It's just saying, like, I didn't even know what you just said. That the uh, the English translation of what he said doesn't seem to be sufficiently faithful to what he actually said in Spanish. Mm-hmm. That's really good info. Um, I also second your, your uh, encouragement to everybody to not just look at headlines and do research for themselves. Mm -hmm. That's very important. Um, What I read quickly uh, this morning, Mm -hmm. skimming over some news, was that there were two statements of the Pope. And like I said, I haven't done my research on this. So uh, fact check me if you want, and you'll probably be right. But I think... There were two statements in that um, movie, right, that mentioned this stuff. And one of them was him saying, like, let me be very clear what marriage is. Marriage is between a man and a woman. This cannot be changed. This was revealed Revealed by by God. God. We were created this way. Extremely clear. And, And to his credit, Pope Francis has been extremely clear on that all throughout his papacy. He said some extremely strong and clear things on what marriage is and what it isn't. Um, and then it seems to me that he was trying to say like, all right, but from a civil perspective, are we saying that nothing is permissible? Um, not even like a legal protection for people. Right. And I think that's, that's where he was trying to go Mm -hmm. with what, what we would call civil unions, which it sounds like there is a distinction even between that and what he meant. Although I'm not sure what that distinction would really be when you got down to it. Right. (sighs) Yeah. And he I also mean, talked about like being part of a family. I know that was part of it as well, like um and being part of the family of God and you can't just throw somebody out if you don't agree with their choices as well. Um It's yeah. tough. All of no, this is well, very there's, tough. There's there's two things that I think are are kind of consistent um with uh, Pope Francis which which are like He's often misunderstood or misconstrued, but I think he also often kind of puts his foot in his mouth um, by saying something off the cuff. Uh, This kind of strikes me as an off the cuff thing that then can be easily carried into a place of misconstrual. Right. But it's hard to tell. Yeah. Um, So I think there's, there's some other distinctions that are important. The first is like, I think a lot of Catholics, when they hear that the Pope said something, they say, how does this affect my belief, right? Um, The Pope saying an off-the-cuff remark in this context is not him teaching to the whole church. Right. Um, He's not teaching from the chair of St. Peter, right? And that's not to say that, you know, we don't pay any attention to it. It's just you got to recognize the context for things. Um, And so, like, if you're... If you're ready to to jump sort of like to he's saying that everybody should wholly endorse same sex marriage like that's that's wrong on a couple counts mm-hmm. um and that could never also be the case that would be in direct contradiction to Catholic teaching. He's not doing that here right 
Um, there's another part of this. Uh, the one thing I saw on, so I'm in the Diocese of Dallas, but right next door we have the Diocese of Fort Worth. And I saw that the their bishop put out a statement on this. I haven't done any research even to see like if my own bishop put out a statement or whatever. It's just one of the, mm-hmm. the things that came up. And I thought it was I thought it was helpful. You can find it on the Fort Worth Diocese website. And it would it's just trying to clarify some of the things that we believe about civil unions. Um, I was actually when I pulled it up, I was gonna read the whole thing, but I think it's better just to pick out a certain few lines. Faithful Catholics must insist that the church's teaching on marriage has not changed and cannot change, right? So that's just speaking clearly. Prevailed by God. Yeah. It's not going to change. Fine. Um, and then talking about rights and how, yeah, this is the last paragraph. It says, it is a misunderstanding of rights to suggest or infer that legal arrangements of civil societies can, f- can confer a status equivalent to marriage to couples who do not conform to God's intention designed for marriage. So there he's trying to to say that like, Civil, whatever whatever the Pope is talking about here is not something that is intended to be equivalent to marriage. Right. Um, but is rather trying to serve some other purpose. Like, I guess, allowing people to visit each other in the hospital or insurance or something. Insurance. And, uh, I don't know. Probably right to... Um, you know, being, being named the person, you know... Uh, you know, the when you're in charge of their health and rights. You know what I'm talking about. I, I want to say yeah, executor, but not executor. Uh, uh, that word just jumped out of my mind. Right. But like those types of things. Yeah, stuff like that. Um, Which really, if can I be blunt and ass? Well, I'm going to be blunt and ass. I'm from New Jersey. Don't you think this would be simple for the church to say, here is the world's kind of like definition of whatever you want to call it, civil unions, any of that. And that is one thing, but the church is just conferring the sacrament. Yeah. Like at what point similar, we have friends that are Hispanic that get married in Mexico. Right. That do those things at separate times. Yes. Civilly married and then church the sacrament conferred so right? it's so i see where you're going with that it is a little bit more complicated than that i'm because, sure it like, is but <laughs> the church doesn't just believe marriage is a sacrament the church also believes that marriage is is something that's like uh, a natural right right and so that people who are not catholic and who get married without any other sort of like natural obstacle to that um are legitimately married it's not a sacramental marriage. Right. But that, that marriage is a real thing. Um, and so that's that makes it a little bit more complicated because it's not just like only within church uh, do we believe that marriage is legitimate. It's it's a, a natural law right. um, for human beings. Yeah. Um, to distinguish between legal protection and marriage, I think is a good distinction uh, one of the criticisms that I'm sure must be uh, coming coming out of this is like, but isn't a, isn't it a slippery slope, right? And I mean, it. I think it is. Yeah. Um, also, it just I don't know. It kind of seems like the civil mer- the civil union thing, like, isn't really where we're at <laughs> in our society. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe it is in other countries, but not in the United States and in lots of Europe like where there is a legalized homosexual marriage right? Uh, for the state law. Like civil unions don't seem to be really the issue there. Right. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's. I guess I I just look at it in the sense that it, it, it feels like it would be easy for the Catholic Church. I understand totally what you're saying about marriages and civilly and outside of the context of the church. But when we're talking about what the church believes, it would seem pretty easy that <laughs> we're in charge of this institution, not us literally, but yeah. 
that we could, you know, I don't think it would contradict anything that God wrote, obviously, and put into play about man and woman and marriage for us to kind of just separate those at some point because it's getting so messy. It is very messy. Um, and yeah, I know there's I, so I many it, nuances belongs, and all of that, but yeah, and and I do see I do see some legitimacy in what you're saying, but I think it also belongs to the church's vocation um, as uh, prophetic to the world mm-hmm. um, to speak into like things that are natural law and to explain them as yeah. like natural law. This is how we were made, um, and that does obviously have theological import, right? Um, but like, it's something that everyone can recognize without special revelation. And so that's, that's part of the way the church is coming. There's also another complicating factor in all this is that like the CDF did put out a document on, uh, same congregation for the doctrine of, of, of the faith. faith. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, Roman, uh, congregation, which is tasked with clarifying doctrinal issues, basically. Um, and it's been a while since I read it, but I want to say it was from like 2003 or something. JP2 was still Pope. Cardinal Ratzinger was head of the CDF. I know it was in that time. And it talked about like, I, if, if I remember right, um, it talked about civil unions and civil these kind of civil unions as a slippery slope. I'm sure um, it is. And so like, that complicates things too. Yeah. So it's so it's messy. Um, I don't want to seem like I'm dodging the question, but I also don't know how to fully answer all of it because people can mean different things, right? Um, and all we have is a an edited. Again, not trying to to wipe it away, but right, uh, movies are edited, so I don't know the full context of what he said. Yeah, and um, once again, like you pointed out, and I'm glad that you did. He was not speaking from the chair of Peter, right? Yep. Ex cathedra, ex <laughs> almost, almost something ex like that. Cathedra, cathedra. Um, yeah, or even in a declarative way that would belong to what's called the ordinary magisterium. So, right. like in a homily, so that's still a different thing than than this. Yeah, and not minimizing it, you right. still have to be aware and say, okay, he's pope. That carries a lot of weight, but and yeah. I think that's what some people have an issue with. Let's just be honest. Yeah. They say, well, he's the Pope. He should know that what he says carries a lot of weight. And I'm like, yeah. I hope we get some clarity on it. Yeah, I hope he listens to our podcast and (laughs) calls in and gives us some clarity. That would be sweet. Okay, I want to answer this next one because it's time relevant. And we handled comments on the election, and we have little time, but it's a pretty simple question. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the person is anonymous. So is it a sin not to vote if I can't stand either person? That is the question. Man, uh, I don't think so. I don't think it's a sin not to vote. Um, it's interesting, though, because we just had a whole homily series this past weekend with the gospel yeah. reading, give to Caesar what is Caesar's voting. Yeah, and the catechism like that. verse that we quoted um, talking about the the importance of voting. So like, not to vote can be done I think in good conscience um, and with a, with, yeah, as, as a good act, I think abstaining from voting, maybe, maybe that's a distinction to make. Um, It doesn't look different in the end, but the intention is very different. Abstaining from voting is, is a conscious act of omission. I'm choosing not to do this. Right. Um, and I think that's a that's a legitimate choice, right? To right. to say I abstain. Um, not voting out of laziness um, seems to be a different thing, right? Um, or not voting because, uh, although I I don't know, although a citizen, I don't think you know that that my role is is important or something like that. Like for some other reasons, why you wouldn't wouldn't vote um like that seems to be my voice doesn't really matter yeah yeah something like that so that seems to be what the catechism is going after but 
um, I think it's a legitimate act, exercise of your freedom to to abstain from voting. But I, I think, feel it's a little bit of a cop out, right? It might be because I feel like we could always find that reason. Well, that's where you have to be honest with yourself. We're very good at rationalizing. Um, the slippery slope. Yeah. You talk, I mean, that applies to so no, many issues. We're very good at it. Um, but that applies across the board, um, you know, where we have to be honest with ourselves about our, our motivations for action and to to strive to act in a way in accord with right reason. Like, So, yeah, I, w- I would encourage people to vote. Um I would certainly say like it's it's problematic if you're not voting out of laziness or disorganization. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you're, I don't know, if you cannot bring yourself in conscience to vote for either one, I I don't think I can I can tell you that's sinful. Mm. That seems that yeah. seems yeah seems strong pretty strong yeah. And on top of it, even if something was sinful, I don't. We're not talking about a mortal sin here. Well, I mean, every sin is bad. Right. Um, and yeah, I think you can vote in such a way that you're committing a, a grave sin. But Right. But like but to, to, not. To, to vote third party candidate or something. I don't know. It's it's complex. Mm-hmm. Are there even third party candidates? Yeah. Have you voted yet? <laughs> not yet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting there. There you go. I'm very busy. <laughs> very busy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I think that's enough heavy stuff for today. What do you think? Yeah, that sounds good. All right. So, they have of, uh, well, I guess submit questions if you have Please. questions. Prodigal and Priest, gmail.com, St. Ann Parish slash PTP. On behalf of Father Paul, Joey Scantella, take care. God bless.